Proverbs chapter 17. Continuing this series called The Way of Wisdom, where we just get to look at one of the Proverbs. <coughs> There's a thousand, <coughs> excuse me, a thousand messages you can preach in the book of Proverbs. Thank you. And it gives me a chance to read the Proverbs every week. I love it. Many weddings, um, that the last wedding I was part of, included the quotation, wherever you go, you know how that finishes? I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. You know where that comes from? The book of Ruth. That's right. It's interesting. Uh, we, most of the time when we hear those words, we hear them in the context of a wedding. And that's totally appropriate. I think it's great. However, um, I think it's notable that the person that said that was not saying it to a lover, to a husband, or to a wife, but to their mother-in-law. Which is really interesting when you think about how much fun we make of the in-law relationship in our modern context. But she was speaking to her mother-in-law, Naomi. Proverbs chapter 17, 17, verse 17, which we're going to read together, says, A friend loves at all times. A brother is born for adversity. A friend loves at all times. Do you have a friend like that? I hope so. I hope everybody in here has a friend that loves them no matter what. And I hope that you are the kind of person that will be a friend to somebody else in the same way. But you know, true, loyal friendship, not as common as it should be. <coughs> the opposite of it, self-interest, very common. What I want to talk about today, tomorrow's Valentine's Day. And I could have preached about, you know, the love of God. Uh, that's usually what people do around Valentine's Day. Or something about husbands and wives. But I wanted to take a different angle on it today. I wanted to talk about the loyal love of a friend. The kind of love you can show towards a friend or the kind of love that you can receive from a friend. And here's the big idea. Because God is loyal to us in Christ. If you're a note taker, this is the, the thing I want you to leave me with. Because God is loyal to us in Christ, we should be loyal to each other. We should be loyal to our friends. Now, an obvious caveat. Are we supposed to love our enemies? Yeah. I mean, Jesus said... Love your enemies. In fact, he went out of his way to say, even unbelievers are friendly to their friends. But that does not mean, um, as, as true as that is, and we should love our enemies, no question about it. As true as that is, there is a sense of loyalty that we should have towards our friends, our true friends. And God tells us as much in his word, a friend loves at all times. Um, message today is going to be pretty simple. I want to briefly describe loyalty and then explain why you should foster the quality of loyalty in your life. We don't talk about loyalty very much in modern America. In fact, loyalty is seen as something, I think in some places it's seen as almost quaint. It used to be that loyalty was valued, not just in families, but in businesses. You remember the old days when you could work at a plant for 50 years and retire with a pension and all that? Uh, we, some of us, old time, I don't care, but some people pined for the old days, before free agency in sports, when a player was drafted and he played for that team till he hit the, hit the pasture. There's lots of uh, avenues through which loyalty is no longer valued. You know, um, if, if, a, if a player sticks with one team 
especially if they win a championship with that one team, we tend to hold that player in higher regard. Somebody like uh, Dirk Nowitzki from the Dallas Mavericks comes to my mind. When, he, when they drafted him, they were terrible, and then he stayed with them a long time and paid his dues, and he finally won a championship with them. And then there's other people that tend to, you know, the thing that bothered people, I don't know if y'all watched it, remember when LeBron James went on ESPN and said, I'm taking my talents to South Beach? That rubbed a lot of people the wrong way because they, I think a lot of people were expecting him to be loyal to Cleveland, and he wasn't. And also the way he announced it. He didn't just say, I'm going to go play for this. He, I'm taking my talents. It was, a, it, was a, it was a big mistake on his part, for sure. But loyalty is something that the Bible says God has towards us, and therefore we should have towards one another. I'm actually going to save the part about God to a little bit later. But what is loyalty? What is loyal friendship? Well, if we look just at this verse, it says a friend loves. Do you have, you, you, think about your friends right now. Are they people that love you? Yes. Or are they friendship? Do we all have friendships of convenience? I think we probably all do. There's nothing wrong with that necessarily. Um, we all have acquaintances, right? People that we know, but we wouldn't necessarily call our friends. But those people, those foxhole type friends, the kind of friends that you might say, they love me and I love them. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means it's consistent. It's at all times. When I'm having a bad day or when they're having a bad day, we are there for each other. It's persistent. There's nothing that can, that can come between me and my buddy, me and my friend. There is a sense of allegiance there. And I think the verse here it paints an obvious picture. It's especially during difficulties. We all, you know, it's easy to be a friend of somebody when everything's going great. But when you're in your low spot and you need somebody to complain to, who do you go to? Who, who are you there for when they're in a low spot? That is the person that is the friend at all times. I think of, and I hate to bring it up again because y'all laugh at me, but the Dallas Cowboys. I love the Dallas Cowboys. Now, I'm not their friend. They don't know me. Sometimes it seems like it. But y'all know how I was with Clemson back in the day. I mean, they went in, what, 81, 82? It was a long time ago. And then there was a long drought. So what, 2000, with Deshaun, what year was that then? Huh, 16? And then they won a couple of them. It was like, return to glory. Well, that's how I feel about the Cowboys. I mean, when I was about 20 years old, 18, between the years of 18 and 21, they won three Super Bowls. That's not good. That's not good for a young man when you're young. You tend to get cocky when you're young and you win that much. It has been a long time that the Cowboys were good. Really good. But a friend of the Cowboys loves at all times. I will not turn my back on them. Now, I said they're not my friend. But that's the way, that's the kind of loyalty. We talk about brand loyalty. There are Chevy people and Ford people, and I never got into all that. I don't care. Just give me something that gets me from here to here. But there are people that say, oh, I've got to have this kind of drink. I'm loyal to it. I'm loyal to this team. That's what we're talking about when we talk about true friendship. Loyal love. That's what the Bible calls it. If you were to do a keyword search in your Bible app on Google for loyal love, the Bible has, shows that word a lot. I think it's very well illustrated by marriage. When people stand up in front of a church or in front of a judge and they say the words, till death do us part. That is a binding covenant that says, I'm going to be loyal to you no matter what. And I'm going to be loyal to you no matter what. And we even spice it up with language like, with language like for better. We all like the for better, right? But there's a the second part of that. Or for worse. In sickness and in health. 
And then the last one, so death, do us part. God has that kind of loyal love towards his people. Another word that we use in church and in the Bible is the word faithful. Are you a faithful friend to those that you call friend? A friend loves at all times, consistently, persistently, with allegiance. You're not there one moment and gone the next. When they call on you, you can depend on them. And when they, and when they call on you, you are there for them. So what are some reasons to be loyal? For this, I want you to turn to another uh, place in the Scripture, um, another poetic book, Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Another place, oddly enough, that's quoted during marriages, during wedding ceremonies. In chapter 4 of Ecclesiastes, verses 9 through 12, it says, Two are better than one. You hear this a lot at weddings. Because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A three-fourth cord, cord is not quickly broken. Usually you hear the first part and the last part at weddings. Two are better than one, and a three-fourth cold cord is not quickly broken. Why should you receive loyal friendship from others and be that kind of friend to some to others? Well, it's very simple. If others need you. People need you. This is the beauty and the strength and the value of coming together as a church. Paul describes the church as a body in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And he says, now, there are different types of body parts. There's eyes, there's nose, there's mouth, there's ears, there's hands, there's feet. But every body part is important and every body part is necessary to do what the body is designed to do. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And Paul's whole point there is you are necessary. You might be here this morning and thinking, I'm not necessary. I'm not that important. But you are. You're a member of Bear Swamp Baptist Church. And more than that, when we come together, we are there for each other. That's what a church body is. I hope we can all say that on some level we are friends. Not just church members. But that we are friends. Other people need you. But here's the flip, coin, the flip side of that coin. You need others. Some people tend to think, I don't need anybody. I am not the kind of person that needs to lean on anybody, but you know the old song. We all need. Y'all can sing it with me, can't you? Somebody. No, you're not going to do it with me? Okay. No. <laughs> Joseph Stalin. Y'all know who he was? communist dictator of Russia for many years. He was a little paranoid. <laughs> that's that's a, an understatement. You would be too if you, uh, you'd been personally responsible for about 40 million people's death. Um, he assumed that somebody was trying to get him at all times. And he had, this, he had this rule. He said, if anybody comes into my bedchambers, to my bedroom, without me personally inviting them, they're dead. He was serious about it, too. He even put his guards to a test one day. It's how cruel he could be. Then again, when I, I think when you're that evil, you are opening yourself up, up to demonic influence. I really do. I think Hitler was demon-possessed. I think Stalin was demon-possessed. I, I really do. But Stalin, one day, he, he, he was in his room, and he started crying out in agony. Ah! Ah! Acting like something was happening to him. But he did not say, guards, come save me. So when they bust in the door, he had him executed. And he said, there's a lesson there for the next guards. Um, he was very paranoid. He kept people at arm's length. You know, 
when you hold people at arm's length, when you don't let anybody into your circle of trust, when you don't have any true friends, you're doing yourself a disservice. We all need somebody to lean on. We all need loyal friendship, and we all need to be the kind of person that others can lean on. Here's a very simple application, I would say. Um, help. When, when somebody needs help, go out of your way to help them. This is really Sunday School 101, isn't it? <laughs> it? It is. But that's how you can be a true friend. Don't just assume, oh, the church is going to do something for them. Reach out. Call them. Text them. Go by. How can I serve you? They might say, I don't need anything, but they might not. And the flip side of that, receive help. I'm going to pick on her because she's not here, but my wife is very good at looking for opportunities to serve, but when, it, when the tables turn and then it's her turn to be served, she is very hesitant to receive help. And I tell her all the time, Say, when you don't allow people to help you, you are stealing a blessing from them. Because that's what helping others is. We weren't put on this earth to serve ourselves. We were put here to serve other people. And that's what a loyal friend does. A, a friend loves Paolo, when, at all times. Especially when help is needed. So we've looked at what loyal friendship is. And some reasons to practice it. Others need you. You need others. I want to take some, very quickly some ways that we can apply that. Husbands and wives. Husbands and wives. Um, should husbands and wives be friends? <laughs> they should be. <laughs> I think sometimes it turns out that way where they're not. But even if you feel like you're in a situation where you're married to somebody that you're not really friends with, you know what? That can be rekindled. Real romance begins with friendship. Long-lasting romance, anyway, begins with friendship. If you have a spouse that you can call your friend, somebody that you can love with on their worst days, you know what? This is easy for me to stand up here and say, but when Natalie's having a really bad day, it's a little bit harder to practice. Y'all know what I'm talking about. <coughs> um, are, are we weird? Are we different? Or is this a common occurrence at home? When, when I'm having a really bad day, I can tell sometimes Natalie just wants to say, what was that movie? Uh, Cher slaps the person and says, snap out of it. You know? <laughs> Mood or something. I forget what, what that movie was called. Does, it, does somebody know? Anyway. She wants you to say, snap out of it. And sometimes that's necessary. But sometimes we just need to sidle up to that person and say, look, how can I help you? How can I help you? You look like you're having a bad time with your kids. Just go off. Uh, get in the car. Go somewhere. I got it. Help. Um, I would say this too. Men, you need men friends. I, I want to be very careful here. I'm not saying that men, you need to go off and find women friends. Well, they don't do that. A recipe for disaster, right? <laughs> women don't go out looking for men friends. Recipes for disaster. But men, then this is one of the reasons that Paul tells Titus that the older men should teach the younger men and the older women should teach the younger women. Works a lot better when you're friends. This is one of the great things about our men's group that we meet on Sunday nights every other week and the women's group that meets every other Sunday night. Guys, you end up... You, I'll just say it this way. Um, it's natural to become closer to people the more time you spend around them. You become friends more naturally that way. And that's why I don't ever want anybody to think that I'm closer to one person or another, but if that happens over time... That's, that's just natural. I want all the men, Meredith might need to clear this with you, but I want all the men to come to the Sunday night men's group. Maybe we, if that started happening, we'd have to start splitting up and going into different homes. Nothing wrong with that either. But men forge some real friendships with other men. 
men that you can learn from, men that you can pass your wisdom onto, somebody that you can love through their darkest days at all times. Women, the same thing. But first and finally, loyalty to God above all. You know, Jesus said to his disciples, and this message resonates down to the centuries to us, he says, I used to call you servants. I don't call you servants anymore. Now I call you friends. Isn't that amazing to think that we are friends of Jesus? Yes, he's our king. Yes, he's our savior. Yes, he's our Lord. But he's also our friend. When we say, when we sing songs like Jesus, what a friend of sinners. That is, that is not sappy, smarmy sentimentalism. That is true. He is your friend. And Jesus, above all people, knows how to love at all times. Because, I mean, that's the heart of the gospel, is it not? Did God wait for you to impress him before he sent his son to die for you? Did he wait for you to prove yourself? For he sent Christ as the sacrifice for your sins. No, he, he saw all the way to our very darkest moments. And there have been some dark moments for you. There have been moments where you, you would be ashamed to stand up in front of us and tell us the things that you've done and said. Everybody in here has that in common. There are no perfect people here. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God, in His grace and mercy, was loyal to us at all times. Not because we deserved it, but because He loves us. And that's what friends do. Remember? Proverbs 17, 17. A friend loves at all times. God loved you at the point of your greatest difficulty, at the lowest moment of your life, and He didn't kick us when we were down. He reached down, picked us up, and now He calls us friends. That is a loyalty that will never end. That is a loyalty that will echo down to the halls of eternity. Jesus and us, friends. Shall we pray?